Good evening and welcome to tea time. Welcome to Tea Time. I'm so glad you're joining me tonight. It is December 6th. That's right, the first Monday in December. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I'm going to talk about my weekend real quick and then get to my guest. For, um, actually, my my um, my weekend actually kind of started on Thursday. I went to Mulcahy's right here in Montau for the John Thiessen Foundation fundraiser, and it was wonderful. I got to see my friend Goose Gossage. That's right, Goose, famous Goose, um, and a bunch of other uh, athletes were there from the Giants and the Rangers and the Islanders and it was just really really nice to just mingle and raise money for a great cause um, Friday morning I go thrifting you know that I'm a thrifter and then I went to Maria Regina right in Massapequa also because they had their craft sale and my daughter Val's Crafty Creations was there and I had a support and then uh, Saturday I went out to lunch with my girl Raquel and um, Sunday is laundry and football because we all need clean underwear. So let me get to my guest because I am so excited. Michael McGlone is joining me and he is in California. So we are doing this via Zoom tonight. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? I'm so well, Teresa. Thank you. How are you? I'm excited. I am so excited and so blessed and so honored. And I want to uh, thank you again for doing my show. Um, oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure as well. Uh, thank you so much. So you're an actor. I want everyone to know you're an actor, you're a writer, you're a producer, director, you're a musician, you're a performer. You do a lot of things. I do. And, um, but, you know, right now I mentioned you're in California, but you're originally from White Plains, New York. Well, I was born in White Plains, New York. We yeah. were actually living in Scarsdale at the time and because that was the nearest hospital that's where i was born uh -huh. though i lived in a lot of different towns in the northeast growing up and then moved to new york city in 1992 or three okay to start my career as an actor and a performer right. and a writer yeah and lived there for 22 years before moving out to los angeles in 2015. wow now let me ask you a question i want to know what kind of kid were you growing up did you always know you wanted to do something in the arts because like i mentioned you're a musician you play guitar so mm -hmm. was acting always your first love or music always your first love what came first i i believe that i was born to do all of these things <laughs> so when i entered the world in, in white plains i believe that my destiny was already known and universally Yes. And it was just a matter of it being revealed to me through experience. Right. So an example would be when I was in first grade, I would tap my feet when we had a musical guest in the classroom and the teacher noticed that I was responding to this music so passionately and that I also enjoyed attention. I would do skits and I would, I would naturally try to draw attention to myself. <laughs> and so they would put me in the school play because, oh, well, he likes attention, so let's do that. Yeah. So, and then going forward, more of these things were happening. And I discovered Edgar Allan Poe when I was 12 or 13. He was my first literary hero. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with his poetry and his stories and this gloominess and this beauty and this love. And I wanted to write like that. So I started writing poems. So there were all of these different experiences that just showed me this is your life and right. this is what's going to be your life 
Yeah. And then finally, I made the decision to pursue all of these things professionally in the early 90s and, and perhaps a little before that. Well, I, I myself, my mother actually put me on the stage at four years old uh, with dancing lessons. And, oh, and then with me, it was just a matter of, yeah, plays in school and chorus and just, yeah, that's, I feel the way you feel. It's, it's like mm -hmm. it's in our DNA. And this is what we were destined to do in any kind of like way, shape or form um, is to be entertainers, to perform mm -hmm. in some way. Um, I know that, um, you know, like I said, you, you played guitar. Um, how old mm -hmm. were you when you picked that up? Well, the first time that I played a guitar, it was because very generously, my parents had given me a guitar per my request okay. for my birthday uh -huh. when I think I was 12 years old. I believe that's accurate. Uh -huh. And so the first time I pick up the guitar, I'm playing around with it and doodling and, and noodling rather. And I am hearing that this one string, when I, when I turn the knob this way is changing <laughs> tone and to the point that I broke the string. And that was the extent of my guitar playing for <laughs> months, maybe even years, Teresa. And this was something I asked my parents for. But then later, I, as my poetry was more voluminous, I realized that I wanted to sing my poetry and I, or I wanted to sing words. Right. And I had already discovered that I could sing subjects again to parental influence. My father, when I was seven years old, sat me down and put on a vinyl record of Elvis Presley, Golden Hits. Nice. And he said, he said, sit down, Mike. You're about to listen to the king of rock and roll. <laughs> and I heard Hound Dog and I was in love with the song, with Elvis Presley, with how he looked, how he sounded. Yeah. I went up into the bathroom that night, combed my hair back like him, <laughs> sang into a brush. And I realized, Teresa, that night when I heard myself, because even at seven years old, I was a qualified judge, <laughs> I sounded good. And I'm a Leo. So, you know, we, we tend to appreciate ourselves. So I, I realized, oh, my goodness, I can sing. This is great. So later in life, after the, the fiasco with the guitar, I pick it up again and I learn some chords and then I started writing songs and, and getting serious about playing and singing and simultaneously and that's how that developed well well you are a very well accomplished um musician because you actually um i listened to some of your songs anyone could go to youtube and just youtube michael mcglone and i i love i loved all of them um thank you a hero tiamo Gos i love gospel broken arrow i mean they're all great and you have thank like you. this you and you have like this raspiness when you sing, I hear more of like a, a raspiness in your voice. It's very um, uh, mesmerizing and it, it, it's, it's engaging. I, li I like the way your voice sounds when you sing. It's totally different from your speaking voice. Thank you so much for those high compliments. And please know my voice changes based on what I'm doing. Okay. So if the song calls for me to roar and get more of that, that gritty gravelly sound that you're referring to, yeah. I'll yeah. do that. If it calls for something that's smoother, I will do that. Right. And I'm very grateful to say that I was given an instrument. I have an instrument that allows me to express it in different ways. Yeah. So one example would be, if you have time later and, you, and you'd and you like, go back to my YouTube channel and click on the Danny Boy link. Yes. And you hear me sing in a very smooth presentation. Right, right. Well, you actually did a, um, a, a your own version of When a Man Loves a Woman. Yes. And I love that song. I don't know anyone who doesn't. And so do I. you actually, um, uh, Percy Sledge actually sang that song back in 1966, and you you were able to connect with him, and he actually taught you the song. I when I when I wrote in the description of the video that he taught me the song. Right. I'm referring to the fact that listening to him <laughs> sing it taught me how to sing it. Right, the right. way that Elvis Presley was my first vocal right, teacher. Right, right, Because I wanted to sound like him, so well, I think I, I'm going gonna, gonna to do what I can to I follow it, whatever he's doing. I think you come pretty darn close, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. And, and in fairness, I, I wasn't 
tr in effort to <laughs> sound like Percy Sledge right. or, or sound like Elvis Presley, at least now. Right. But in the past, or even Michael Bolton, for that matter. Right, exactly. The The idea when I was younger made me was to sound like other people because I hadn't come into my own and I perhaps didn't have the confidence that, well, your voice is equal to anyone else's in its own idiosyncratic way. So you want to sound like yourself more than you want to sound like somebody else. Right. So when I talk about how someone taught me a song, it's more <laughs> in relation to the greatness of their gift and the greatness of how they sing that song right. teaches me how to sing because I want to sound like that. Well, you actually recorded and produced four albums? Yes, well, it's actually three full-length records okay. and then one EP, which stands for Extended Play, if right. you didn't know that. And that means that it's not a full album, but it's not a single. So it's somewhere, I think, between 15 and 25 minutes of music or four to five tracks as an EP. Right. So I have an EP called The Center, three full length records mm -hmm. and several singles that are all available across the web. Now, did you do any writing or any recording during COVID when we were really shut down? Oh yeah, uh, I did potentially. I mean, I don't know how it would have been without the health crisis having happened, though I potentially did more writing as a result of it, because that was something that didn't stop and didn't have to stop. Yeah, yeah. But other things, of course, did. So I would say that, yes, I, I definitely did a lot of writing. And I, as I say, may have even done more than I would have otherwise. Right. Is there anyone else that's musical in your family? Not that was expressed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I believe that everyone has music in them. Yeah. I, I believe everyone has an artist in them. And that's why I answer that way, because they didn't pursue it, though I won't say that that means that they're not musicians or artists. Right. right. I was... I was, I was born with, in addition to these various abilities, also an inherent confidence in those abilities. Yeah. So I didn't doubt when I was growing up that I could do things. I, I just jumped in and did it and felt good about it. Which, and that's a real blessing. Which was the first song you wrote and recorded? The first song that I wrote is not the first song that I recorded. Okay. But I will tell you that the first song that I wrote was inspired by a young lady, naturally, uh -huh. called Romina because her name was Romina. And I fell in love with her when I was, I think 14 or 15 oh, years old. Oh, sweet. <laughs> and yes, I, I met her on a family vacation to Vail, Colorado. Aww. She was maybe four or five years older than myself. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just saw her and thought she's so beautiful and lovely. And I wrote her poems in Vail, Colorado, and I found out where she was staying. And I, I, I don't know exactly how, but I think I, I delivered her poems. And she, so she got the poems and we ended up having a meeting wow. on the night before I left or the night before she left. I can't remember what it was, but yeah. we only had one meeting together, but she made a major impact on me. And I wrote this song called Romina. That was the first song that I finished. At least that's the memory that I have of the first song that I finished. Nice. Later, the first song that I recorded uh -huh. was probably Hey, which is the first song of my first yeah. album. Uh -huh. If you're asking about album recordings and right, that type right, of thing. Right, right, I'm waiting for someone to write a song uh, with Teresa in it. It's not very popular, but um, there's a group out there called TKA, if you're familiar with them, and they sing a song, Maria. So I said to them, change the word to Teresa, because it kind of like went. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. But uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, I, that's interesting that there isn't, because Teresa is such a classic name. Yeah. And it's such a historic name. I would have thought that, that Teresa already existed in, nope. in our musicology. <laughs> No, not yet. Okay. Not we'll yet. see about that. Not yet, we'll Michael. see about that. <laughs> so listen, um, I want you to stay right where you are. We okay. are going to take my first break. More when I come back with Michael McGlone. Don't go away.
1331 Mediterranean Grill is located at 1906 Newbridge Road in Belmore, specializing in traditional Greek cuisine. Opa! You can dine in, take out, and they deliver. They also cater for all occasions, and they have outdoor seating. Give them a call at 516 516- 804-6197. Check them out on Facebook and go to their website, 1331 Mediterranean Grill. Hi, I am Linda Davides. I am a psychic clairvoyant medium and certified healer. I have also written a book, My Journey from Darkness to the Light, which is available on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, and on my website, www.healingsonthego.com. If you would like to book an appointment with me, call me at 917-929-4935. Thank you. Well, hi there, Teresa. It's John York from General Hospital. I am just checking in because apparently you have a great talk show called Tea Time on Strong Island TV. I want you to have continued great success and have a lot of fun. It sounds like you're having a lot of fun, and that's pretty much the key to everything, isn't it? So continued success. I'm proud of you. Have a great day, Teresa. Bye. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tea Time. I'm so glad you're joining me tonight because I am here with Michael McGlone. And Michael is an actor. He's a writer. He's a director. He's a producer. He's a musician. He's a performer. The man does it all. And I'm sure you've seen him in something. We talked before the break about his musical background, how he produced and recorded um, four albums. He has amazing songs. I enjoyed listening to all of them. So when you get a chance, you could go to YouTube, punch in Michael McGlone, and just pick, pick, pick them all and just listen to them all <laughs> i was just sitting there one after the other i'm like this is great it's like a concert for, like a Thank private you, concert for myself um but i want to talk to michael about his acting because uh michael and i have a lot in common both our mothers are named gene hi mom michael waves hello. to mom say hi mom say hi mike michael say hello. hi to your mom and they're both named gene <laughs> that's great and um so you grew up in upstate, White Plains, and then you moved to the city, and you wanted to get into acting. And I want to know, what was your very first, first gig, paid gig you ever landed? The first paid gig that I had was a voiceover for Pizza Hut. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that was something that I did not know would reward me as substantially as it did because it was in the first year, I believe, of my presence in, in New York City. Right. And that happened almost simultaneous to my meeting with Eddie Burns uh -huh. and he and I agreeing to make a film together called then the McMullen brothers, right. which later was called the brothers McMullen and went to Sundance and won. Right. And right. the reason I can't say that that was my first paid gig is because first of all, it didn't happen before pizza hut. Right. And when we were shooting it, right. it wasn't paid. We oh. were paid after the fact. Okay. Everyone worked for free initially on that movie. That is so interesting to know because um, as an actor, I've done a lot of indie films and I've done mm -hmm. a lot of stuff where, you know, I get the cred on IMDb, but, you know, yeah, sometimes they don't have a budget. Sometimes they do have a budget. And I, mm -hmm. I don't say no to anything because you never know, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you're, and you're proof of that. So tell That's me. That's certainly how I felt then, yeah. How did you meet Ed? And tell me about the audition process. Oh, my goodness. Wonderful story. There was a time in my very early career, this is the first, probably the first, as I say, nine months of my living in New York City, where I was putting in headshots for various projects. I believe there was an agent who had expressed an interest in me, so I was hearing from them occasionally. I think that's accurate. And I wasn't getting the attention that, frankly, Teresa, I thought I deserved. I wasn't getting the auditions. 
I, I wasn't getting called back from auditions where I thought it went very well. It's any number of things. I feel you. And I feel you. Not getting jobs, not getting attention. <laughs> and for Leo, of course, that's just disaster. <laughs> right. So this is what I say at about nine months into my career, which hasn't even started yet, really, technically speaking. Yeah. But to me, of course, it already happened. So I'm thinking this. You know what? They don't want to give me the auditions. They don't want to give me the attention. I'm out. I'm going to deprive the entertainment industry <laughs> of Michael McClone. So I say, I'm done. I'm not going to audition anymore. And so I, I, I literally, I retire myself out of resentment for the attention that I'm not receiving. I start writing a book that later is called Cal. So I devote myself to my writing. And then I realize one day that, you know what, this idea that you're not going to audition and you got to deprive them of Michael McGlone is absurd. <laughs> and you're, you didn't come here to deprive the entertainment industry of you. You came here to enter the entertainment industry. So go out today and get backstage, which was then a, an actor's trade. It's a yes, paper. yes. And I went out and I got backstage that day. I, this is my memory of it. And what I saw in there was an ad for the movie that became the Brothers McMullen. Wow. It was an ad for the McMullen Brothers, an independent film, non-paying, that was about three Irish-American brothers, the youngest of which was Patrick McMullen. Yes. The youngest of our three Irish-American brothers is Patrick McLone. So wow. I thought, oh my goodness, this is a natural. I throw in a headshot, and again, Teresa, I don't get a call. And this time- What? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm livid because th my name's McClone. Just based on my name, you should be calling me in. Uh, but it was just a matter of whatever their schedule was because I did get called in. Right. And I had this wonderful meeting with Eddie Burns. And I believe the cinematographer also was in that first audition too. Okay. So Eddie and I read together. Yeah. And this material was so well written, yes. Teresa. Yes. And you've seen the movie? Yes. Okay, so you know how well Eddie wrote that script. Yes. And I'm looking at this movie and I'm I'm having this scene with with Eddie that could have been taken right out of my history. Yes. Growing up talking to my brother <laughs> yes. and my brothers. So it's very natural for me. And I feel like I'm crushing this. This is my life. Right. I mean, I'm I'm basically walking into something that is is extremely natural to me. Yeah. So I leave, I don't hear anything again. I'm thinking, how is that possible? It just, again, was their schedule. I bump into him on the subway. He sits next to me, or I sit next to him on the subway. I can't remember exactly how it was, but we end up on the subway next to each other. Right. And I look at him like this. He looks at me, and he basically says, it looks like we're going to call you. I get a call back. I go in again. I read again. I think there was a young lady who was then going to be a part of the project. Right. She didn't turn out being a part of the project, but we read together a chemistry read type thing. Mm -hmm. And then he came out with the script after that reading, placed it down and in his very charming, approachable way said, you're ready for this. And <laughs> I, my answer could have been vocal or it could have been silent, but I was ready for it. Yes. Yeah. And we made it and it was a, a blessing and a gift to, to, Many people in that movie. Oh, absolutely. There, there are no accidents, Michael. That's how I feel. You know I, what I mean? I am absolutely in agreement with that. It was, it was meant to be. That was back in 1995, and um, and then 1996, you you did She's the One with uh, Jennifer Aniston and Cameron Diaz. That's not too. That, that's correct. Not yeah. too shabby. <laughs> no, it was fabulous. Eddie received a, a, a great deal of very due and deserved attention after. Brother McMullen was released, and Fox Searchlight, who released Brother McMullen, decided that they wanted to make his next movie, too. And so they gave him somewhere between three and five million dollars to make She's the One. Right. And he had already a reputation from the Brother McMullen that brought people to the table. So people like Jennifer Aniston and and Cameron Diaz and John Mahoney yeah. were interested in working with him yeah. because they loved the Rose Mullen so much and there was so much heat on you, it and do, Eddie. Do you remember what and the budget so do you remember we, what the budget was for Brothers McMullen? Brothers, the original budget was somewhere around twenty five thousand, <laughs> which was the result of Eddie's father very generously just giving that to him. And I think it was his dad's life savings. He just said, 
you know what? This is your this is your movie. You make this, and there it is. So you go from twenty five grand to three to five mil for the second right. one. That's a huge yeah. jump. <laughs> yeah, very big, and you could feel it on the set. Of course, it was a much different experience, and there were things about the the experience of She's the One that made it very special because we're getting that attention and we worked hard for it right so that all feels wonderful and that was very special in its in its right right rosic bullen no less though without any money teresa there's a magic in what we did there it and the feeling on set every day yeah. there's no other set that will feel like that for me no. and that's no with no dishonor to any future right, set right, that i'm on right. or any set that i've done yeah but there's nothing like going to work unpaid just for the enthusiasm for the of being love of there. it, Michael. It's the love of it. The love and of working acting. working with people who are fabulous because we had so much fun and we had no idea <laughs> that it was going to go to Sundance or anything. And it was Amazing. just pure love Amazing. coming. And I think that that's a, a reason why the, the movie succeeded so much is because it was so pure. It was. It was. It was as pure as you can get, and that's why I loved it. I, I, I I've seen it more than once, and the first I remember watching it the first time. I'm going, this is a freaking great movie, and it is. It's Thank so you. relatable. You know, I come from a, an Italian family, and you know, we're just as crazy. So it's very relatable, and I, and 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 it was great, and it just seemed that everyone was well casted. Very mm -hmm. well casted, you know. It mm -hmm. just—it was like, like you said, it was—it was written for you. Thank you so much. You know, I'll tell you when I first looked at the character breakdowns in the paper too. I was writing a book at the time, and I thought that I would be perfect for the middle brother because Eddie didn't put in the ad that he was going to be playing that. He posted descriptions for all three characters. Right. So I thought, oh, screenwriter, yeah, it's me, that's it. <laughs> and it ended up being, uh, I'm playing the youngest of the three brothers, and it was perfect. It was perfect for you, perfect. And then 19, you. 1999, another favorite movie of mine that I like to watch all the time is Bone Collector with Denzel. Thank you you with, with Denzel, you with Ed, you with Angelina. I mean, right. that was another great movie that I got, you know, caught caught like a spider in. I was like, wow, this is a great movie. And you, you I think you really bring authenticity to every character you play. And I think that's why it comes off so flawless. Oh, well, thank you so much, Teresa. What a delightful comment. And on that set, there was the creation of a character that I later developed a TV show around, and we're still in development with that. Oh, wow. I played a character in The Bone Collector called Kenny. And yes. I created an alter ego on set called Kenny the Gun, who was a different guy, different character than was in The Bone Collector. But I would walk up to Eddie O'Neill or Angelina, and I would have a very kind of typical New York accent, and I'd say, <laughs> oh, my friend, it seems you've forgotten with whom you'd be on. <laughs> Oh, gone. So I would walk up, and then I'd flack the jacket back. I'm wearing a Glock on my right hip. And I tap the gun and say, no gun. And so this character That's was great. initially just born out of my enthusiasm to perform for people and be with my friends and have fun. Love it. Later, Queen Latifah was also on that movie. And she said to me, yes, she you was. gotta do something with that. Yeah. And at the time it registered with me. Yeah, that makes sense. But at the time I didn't know what to do. Didn't have that really on my mind about producing television, et cetera. But later, he stayed with me because he's a very powerful character. And if you're interested in seeing a trailer for the the the, the series of the original, the first iteration yes. of it, go to my website and click on Kenny the Gun, the I, link to Kenny the Gun. I actually watched it. Oh, so, so that's the trailer it. to the first iteration I love it. I love of it. the series. I love it. And there's actually been development since then. Yes. And so you can stay tuned on that one. Love and, it. I love it. And I'll let you know it when, was when very, things are I love it. I love it. It was great. Um, listen, Thank we're going to go to break real quick. But please. everyone, please stay where you are. Don't go away because I have so much more with Michael McGlone when we get back. <laughs> Thirteen thirty one Mediterranean Grill is located at nineteen oh six Newbridge Road in Belmore, specializing in traditional Greek cuisine. Opa! You can dine in, take out, and they deliver. They also cater for all occasions and they have outdoor seating. Give them a call at five one six. 
804-6197. Check them out on Facebook and go to their website, 1331 Mediterranean Grill. Hi, I am Linda DeVitis. I am a psychic, clairvoyant, medium, and certified healer. I have also written a book, My Journey from Darkness to the Light, which is available on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, and on my website, www.healingsonthego.com. If you would like to book an appointment with me, call me at 917-929-4935. Thank you. No, How you doing? It's Sal, the voice of Valentinetti. Why are you watching me? You should be watching Teresa Canis Tracy Tea Time with Teresa Canis Tracy Farrell. And make sure you, you you follow Teresa on Facebook. Tea Time with Teresa Canis Tracy Farrell. We'll see you there. I love the way you say my name. I love. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tea Time. I want to thank 1331 Mediterranean Grill right in beautiful Belmore. They have delicious Greek food there. Thank you to Linda Davides. I had her on last week. Great guest. And uh, thank you, John York from General Hospital for those beautiful kind words. And Sal, the voice, Valentinetti. Um, he's going to be actually in Westbury. We, I still say Westbury Music Fair. Other people don't. But he's going to be there December for the fourth year in a row. And I'm hoping to have my friend Sal on after that. Give some shout outs to Hello Bruno and Linda and Michelle, Eddie, my cousin Eddie Montori, Kristen Tinsley, Frank, um, all these people watching, please like the show, please share it. I'm very, very excited um, to let everyone know that my show, Tea Time, has been nominated for the second year in a row, Beth Page, Best of Long Island podcast. And you can go to my Tea Time page on Facebook and you can vote every day up until December 15th. I'm just so blessed that someone thought of me and nominated my show. I am a very lucky girl. And also, um, I just wanted to say that um, you can watch Tea Time every Saturday morning, 11 a.m. on Channel 20 for those people on Long Island who get Optimum Cable Vision. So you could tune in and watch me on Saturday afternoon. I'm excited about this. Um, 11 a.m. Channel 20. So I'm back with Michael McGlone. He is an actor, writer, producer, director. He's a musician. He's a performer. Um, and before the break, we were talking about the movie. The movie that was a phenomenal experience of a lifetime with Eddie Burns, um, the brothers McMullen. And that was back in 1995. We talked about She's the One with Jennifer Aniston and Cameron Diaz. We talked about The Bone Collector with Dan Zell and Angelina and Queen. And it was just, what a cast. What a cast. Indeed. And um, and then you also did a third film with Eddie, right? You did the Fitzgerald Family the Christmas. Fitzgerald Family Christmas. And thank you for bringing that up because it's a wonderful film for the holidays. I don't just say that because I'm in it. It's a very well-written, well-acted family-oriented piece. Yes, and you play Quinn. I play Quinn Fitzgerald, a very fiery Irish brother. Wow, so that's a stretch for you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. And I'll tell you, this is a guy who, in the course of the film, goes over to another guy's house because that guy was wrong with Quinn's sister yes. and jacks him up against the wall. Uh -huh. And have you seen the movie? I saw, I saw, I saw some of it. I didn't see all of it. I got to watch it. Okay, all. I, I, I recommend it. I, I, it's a fabulous movie, and I love playing hot-headed Irish guys because <laughs> it's a real stretch. No, I love playing them because it's not a real stretch. Sometimes you like it because it's a challenge. Other times you like it because you can just do it because you know and you love those guys. Right. Right. Totally. I totally get it. I had a gig a couple of weeks ago and uh, they asked me, can you play an, oh, I, I, I'm, I, someone said, never say you're a character actor, but I, I, I put on a wig and I transform myself. I can make myself look like anything. And they wanted me to play an old Italian woman. So I put on the gray wig and a house dress and the Italian accent and everything. And it's kind of like, yeah, it's like, this is like, I'm, I'm kind of like bringing in my grandmother now with me. Do you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, sure. it's, it's not that far of a stretch, but it, it kind of make, it, it, it's comfort, like a comfort place in a, in mm -hmm. a way, you know what I mean? Because it's just so um, uh, well connected, if that makes Indeed. any sense. Indeed. And I want to divert slightly just for a moment to acknowledge my mom one more time. Oh, go ahead. And I'm going to directly say to my mom, Mom, how much do you love Teresa's accent? 
Oh. My mother <laughs> loves a New York accent. I know that as she's listening to this, whether it's in real time or later when oh. I send her the link, she's going to love your accent. Well, my mother, I think, in a previous life was a Brooklyn, New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> just like yours. Well, I'll tell you and... the truth, Michael. I'm originally from Queens, and I can't say talk instead of talk, and I can't yeah. say coffee instead of coffee. I mean, I have to just really be aware of it because there are some roles where I have to drop, you know. Yeah, my, and, and you do that, but you know. it's it's certainly un unnecessary <laughs> with, with certain people. Right. And with my mom, she'd want you to step it up, if uh, anything. Well, I can. Believe me. Well, actually, I'm sure I, you can. I had sent you that video when I do that the lot the New York Lottery commercial when I do Maria DeMarco. She's a little uh -huh. bit stronger than me. <laughs> uh huh. It's great. It's fabulous. And I wanted to say that to my mom because I knew it would jazz oh, her to so hear me sweet. say that in the interview. And I know that I I, I know that it, it's true. So oh. it's something I wanted. You to know as that's well. great that's my great. mom sometimes says on the phone to me when we're talking she'll say we'll have coffee we'll talk <laughs> your people will call my people we'll oh, talk that's we'll sweet talk. that's so yeah. sweet so yeah we we both have we're so blessed to both have our mothers my Indeed. mom my mom's gonna be 84 and my mom's name is Jean your mom's name is Jean that's great yes. bless when's her birthday Teresa my mother's birthday is May 4th okay yeah lovely yeah. My mom's July 18th. Nice. Yeah. And so, getting back to you, let's get back to you yeah. real quick. You've done, the movies is incredible. You've also done a lot of TV. You did Another World, you did That's Life, uh, The Kill Point, Law and Order. My daughter said to me, until you're on Law and Order, Ma, you know, I really don't care what else you do. I'm like, gee, thanks, Val. Like, that's going to validate me. I'm, um, I'm glad that I meet the standard. <laughs> And, Sounds um, like a heavy standard. It is. It really is. And then you were in um, Psych, and you were in Elementary, and Person of Interest. You were there from what, 2011 to 2016? I, I wasn't there the whole time. It was a recurring role, though. So yes. on IMDb, they just give the, the years that the show was yeah, active. Yeah, yeah. So I was on that for uh, a number of episodes. And that was great. And then you Thank landed you. Um, Geico. Hello. Yeah, that was Gorgeous. That is a beautiful thing. Me. Beautiful thing because, you know, uh, people who do like the Allstate commercial and progressive and, and flow and whatever. State Farm, yeah. Yeah. You land a national commercial like that and you are laughing all the way to the bank. And you, you got this Geico gig um, and it's the rhetorical question campaign, which I loved. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you were great at it. And I love your voice because you went to that, you know, you went to like that commentate. That commentate film noir, voice. Yeah, yeah, old school, <laughs> which lives in my heart. I, there's, there's a part of me and it's a large part of me that would be so comfortable just jumping right into the 1940s and living there. I always or say, the 1950s. I, I always say I was born in the wrong era. Seriously, mm -hmm. always. I well, I, I think I will say that my viewpoint of it is that we were born in the right era because we're in this era and we were meant to be here. This Though, I think we'd both be totally appropriate in that other era, too. Yes, give and me that, a, actually, yes. I think, can only help this era because we need some of those values to be infused here. There's a beautiful balance we can create. Absolutely. Because there's, there's been a little loss of touch with, with certain traditional values in certain respects of our, our our dealings with each other that I think the 50s values and the 40s values can enhance. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's so true. Well, I know you 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 worked on music during COVID, you know, during the lockdown. A lot of people um, had to find different things to do. Um, it was uh, it was it was different for everyone during COVID, especially people mm -hmm. in the entertainment industry where literally came to a stop. Broadway shut down. It was it was. It was really, it was like someone was shaking you, saying, hey, this is, you know, a new reality now. Get used to it. Um, some people worked out at home. Some people wrote songs. Some people did Zoom comedy in front of, mm, no, sure. in front of no audience. Um, you know, some people got very creative. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you, again, like I said, you, you, you turn to music, which is a love of yours, which I, is actually, when I said that I wrote during that, the health crisis during the lockdown, it wasn't in regard to music. It was in regard to the screen, the screen. I, 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 I think I was at work. I was potentially editing a book uh -huh. of mine and I was, I was also in development 
for a series of mine. Okay. So it wasn't the music that was happening in that phase. Right. Speaking about development, um, there's something that's going to be happening, Peace at Home. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. I, I don't know where that project is. Okay. Though they have an interest in me playing a character by the name of Professor Stan. Uh -huh. And I, I, I know that it's whatever they decide on the final script, it will have a good and wholesome message. That's the that's the energy that has come off that project from the beginning when they first solicited me for it. Yes. And I don't know where it is right now, but when they're ready to move forward, I'll be happy to have good the discussion to go. about good to doing go. that. I know I'm on hold. So I'm on hold for something also. Um, I, I got this TV series. We're supposed to be filming in Pennsylvania. Um, it's called Recipes of Love. I play an Italian mother. Big stretch. So great. <laughs> You're going to crush it, and I look forward to seeing it. Um, what else are you working on? Is there anything else that you have on the back burner? I'm current, not even on the back burner, but the front burner. I am I like the front. <laughs> the front. Oh yeah. I, I mean, backs are fine too. Back burner is great too. And I've got a bunch there, but when is the front burner? Let's talk about it. I am shooting an episode of SWAT right now. I'm yes, actually you are. in the midst of that right now. Yes, you are. And I'm playing a particularly nasty character which i love you posted a picture because... everyone go to my facebook page you'll see the picture i i think i share i think i shared it but it, it, you, you, oh, look, you. you look a little scary like i say yes, kind of and, and, and that is for good reason he's a he's a, an organized crime connected bomb maker who is in the midst of the storyline serving a life sentence and there's a breakout a prison breakout involved there are explosions that I'm respond that my character is responsible for. Really nasty dude, but at the same time, a family man. Yeah. So there's this balance between the two, and how they show both is important in the course of the story as well. Because he has two sons, he has an estranged wife, and you can see that yes, this is a criminal, dangerous guy, and nasty, as I said. Though you you also get to see that he's not without his humanity too. Right, he's he's still human. He his still has a family. Humanity, that is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 when are you going to be filming that? I'm, we're filming it now. I had a day of work, not yesterday, but the day before, and I'm okay. going back on the 10th of December to finish. Right. I've had a number of days up to now, and I'll have one more day on the 10th, and then the episode will be. I think the wrap of the entire episode is on that day, or if not that day, it will be soon after. Uh -huh. And then it will air at some point in the future. I, I don't want to say that I know exactly what day right. that is because I, I don't know well, for sure. Well, you let me know. You'll let me know and I'll oh, share it with everybody. I definitely let you know and I'll let everybody yeah. on who wants to know on Facebook too. Awesome, yeah. awesome. And you and... and um, It's episode 13 though, for, if anyone wants to know what that is. Okay, that's important to know, episode 13. Yeah, yeah. that way at least you, you, you know, you could like keep an eye out. Sure, for it. if they want do you, to. Do you, do you, oh yeah, I, you're, you're born to do everything, you know, TV, movies, music. Um, I hate to ask you this, but is there one that you favor over the other? I mean, because you thank know as well. For, thank you. I don't ever want you to cultivate hate in your heart, but no, I'm going to well, say Michael, this. Listen, thank you for hating to ask me that because <laughs> it's a question, and this is totally with a loving heart, sweetie. I, I mean this with only the most positive energy. I, When I hear that question, there's always this challenge that exists. I know. About answering it because... I don't want to dishonor anything no, that I, I do. No, I know, I know, I know. And it's all, and, and to some extent, it's impossible to answer because I don't even know how to quantify and express how all, all the different things that I do affect me. I know they affect me positively. Right, right, right. And on an equal level. Right. Just in, in different ways and on different schedules. Right. No, I get it. And I the totally get it. The hate was all love. I totally get it. I don't get... ever want you to have hate no, in your heart. No, I totally so get it. I totally get it. Ever. But you and I know what it's like to perform also in front of a live audience, and there's nothing yeah. like hearing that, you know, that response. That's fabulous, yeah. Okay, and we're going to... And, and with reference to what I was saying before about it's just on a different schedule, if you look at stand-up comedy or being in a play you have that more instant gratification 
of the approbation or the opposite. And right. you hope it's not going to be the opposite, but right. that's also possible. Yes. When you're in a movie, you're shooting it and you only have a minimal kind of audience experience with the crew and other people on the set. Yes. Then your larger audience is when the film is released or when the television show airs, et cetera. And then it's piecemeal. You get the approbation on the street later or through a comment or through this or through that. And it's not more immediate. Right. And I, so that's why I say yeah. I, I can't even, and I don't know how it, how the metrics of it all, <laughs> but I know that writing a song and singing a song and being able to do that yeah. fills me with this, this feeling of gratitude that I can do that yeah, and sing yeah. a song for someone who needs to hear a song or a woman I want to impress right. or <laughs> whatever it is, yeah, yeah. or, you know, being, being in a, in a television show and then reaching millions of people is fabulous. I know. Reaching, re reaching 400 people in one theater or 10 people right. at a stand up show when you're doing a bit. Yeah. It's all, it's, it's all so beautiful. It is. It, all, it is all, it all is. It all is. And, and what's beautiful right now is I have to take my last break. Please. Everyone, everyone's going to stay right there because when we come back, we're going to talk about performing live with Michael McGlone. We'll be back. <laughs> Don't go away. And the reason I made the, 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 the Don't. additional, don't go away. Right now, we'll be back. Bobby? Hello? Oh, is it I'm still running? I'm going to break. Okay. Yeah, he'll edit it. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Thirteen thirty one Mediterranean Grill is located at nineteen oh six Newbridge Road in Belmore, specializing in traditional Greek cuisine. Opa! You can dine in, take out, and they deliver. They also cater for all occasions and they have outdoor seating. Give them a call at five one six eight zero four six one nine seven. Check them out on Facebook and go to their website. 1331 Mediterranean Grill. Hi, I am Linda Davides. I am a psychic clairvoyant medium and certified healer. I have also written a book, My Journey from Darkness to the Light, which is available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and on my website, www.healingsonthego.com. If you would like to book an appointment with me, call me at 917-929-4935. Thank you. Doc, who's the best comedian you know? Teresa Farrell. And who's the best actress you know? Teresa Farrell. And who's the best cast member in Bat Boy? Teresa Farrell. Who's got the best radio? Teresa Farrell. Doc, who's your favorite Jimmy? Teresa Farrell. Who are you loving right now? Teresa, <laughs> <laughs> Teresa Farrell. All right, Doc. I love you too, baby. Love you as always. Thank you. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tea Time. I'm so glad you're joining me tonight. I want to thank everyone for watching the show. Please like it, please share it, and you can tune in every Saturday morning, 11 a.m. on Channel 20 for people on Long Island who get cable vision, optimum cable vision. I'm with um, actor, writer, producer, director, musician, performer, Michael McGlone, and I am just so excited that Michael and I became friends on Facebook, and I'm so blessed that he's joining me tonight and doing this, really. Um, I'm, I've been a huge fan for a really, really long time, and and um, I'm just so thrilled that he's here. Right before the break, we were talking about performing, whether it be TV, movies, you know, music. And um, I came across a uh, video of Michael performing at the Metropolitan Room. Did about eight minutes. Uh, that's what was there. I don't know if he did more or less, but. Oh, um, well, that was the full bit. Yeah, that was a full bit. And what I really, really liked about it is that. Um, it was comedic storytelling, and what you did is you, you, you're telling true stories that are so funny and, again, relatable, and I don't want to, I want everyone to find Michael on michaelmaglone.com, go to YouTube, Michael Maglone, just Google Michael Maglone, you'll see everything there that he does and he offers his, his uh, fans and, you know, and everyone that um, follows him and watches him, just, just go to his page, everything is there. And um, I watched it and at first I was thinking, what is he doing? I wasn't sure what you were gonna do and then I'm watching it, I'm going, he's funny, you are a funny guy. Thank you. 
You know, I started stand-up stand up in the early 90s. I did it for a few years. I stopped when I had my daughter and then went back into it about five, six years ago. But mm -hmm. what made you get up and do that? And was that the first time you did that? No, I, I performed stand-up on stage for the first time at Caroline's Comedy Club as a part of the Brewer Unleashed show. Uh-huh. Jim Brewer and my friend Pete Corielli were the co-hosts of Jim's show, Brewer Unleashed, on Sirius XM. Yes. And my friend Pete Corielli, who's a fabulous stand-up comedian, would have me on the show. Jim also enjoyed my movies and me and was gracious enough to have me on his show. Right. And then Pete invited me to be a part of comedy covers. Okay. And I was the first actor to ever be invited on the show the first so at, at cool. that time non-comedian to do the show and the show was you uh, you come up and you do the work of another comic right. either at your as yourself uh -huh. or an alter ego okay. and so what i did was george carlin's comedy as christopher walken <laughs> that's great and Teresa, when you see it which i hope you do <laughs> i have to you're going to love it i have to Yes. And from there forward, people started associating me with stand-up comedy, calling me a comedian. And at first, I, I, I was reticent to accept such an honorable term because I consider it that. I, I now do accept it because I do work in that field and I have a YouTube channel that has my, my stand-up comedy honored, et cetera. Right. Though initially it was because Pete invited me to be a part of it. And then P other people wanted me to be a part of shows that they were giving. And that was one of them. Elise Kenny, who's also a stand-up com uh, comic and an actress mm -hmm. of, of great ability in both areas, was, was having a, a night of comedy. And she called it dysfunctional for the holidays. And she was <laughs> aware that I did comedy as well from the Brewer Unleashed. And she said, would you come and, and be a part of dysfunctional for the holidays? Right. And at first, I, well, you saw the bit. At first I was, I, I was, I held back. I wondered, I don't know if I have fun, funny stories to share, but then I realized, whoa, you do actually. So go ahead and do it. And I was delighted to do it. I love stand-up comedy. I love doing it. I don't pursue it the way that people who do it, quote unquote, for a living do. Right. But if anyone ever wants me to come and, and, and do something, I'll do it. And I cultivate stand-up comedy all the time. I have a comedy channel called Madman Michael McGlone, uh -huh. which is all about my comedy. Yep. And I saw that I too. Fully, I have fully accepted that as a part of my life. And frankly, I was always very honored that I was called a comedian. And even before I had any experience of doing that, I was called a comedian by someone who absolutely penetrated my heart ultimately by calling me that. I had an audition with Tom Hanks years ago for a movie that he was doing, and he paid me the compliment of saying, I don't remember what the nature of the conversation was at that point, but he said, well, you're just such a natural comedian that, and I thought, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't contest it. And I thought, this guy's calling me a comedian? Wow. This is amazing. Yeah. It was one of the greatest compliments I've ever received from someone who is not only a supreme gentleman, but a supreme talent, supreme ultimate. And that was one of the highest compliments and one of the nicest experiences I've ever had in my life. Wow. Yeah. That's great stuff. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. You're so welcome. <laughs> My so pleasure. Listen, Michael, we have about a minute and a half left. So what I want to do is I want to reiterate your website. It's michaelmaglone.com, and you could go yes. to Michael's website. Everything is there. Everything is there. You could go to YouTube and click on Michael Maglone, um, it, and and just listen to his music. Again, he, he, he puts stuff out there all the time, which is really nice to let fans and people who want to follow you know what you're, you know, what you're doing. You're not on Instagram, though, huh? I was, and I decided not to be anymore because I, I don't want to feel inundated by social media responsibility. Yeah, I get it. And at times, I'm, I, 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 I can feel that just being on Facebook. Yes. And... I, I feel that that's enough. I feel yeah. that Facebook yeah. is enough. All right. Well, look, I want to I wanna thank you again for doing this for me. I also want to tell you 
the next time you're in New York visiting your mom, I'd love to have mm. you in studio. <laughs> I would love to be in studio. When I visit my mom, it's in Greensboro, North Carolina. She's not in New York. Oh, she's not in New York. No, she's not in New York. Though well, when you come visit will, other, when you come visit other family or friends, yeah, in uh, New York. And, and, and New York is inevitable for me because it's always a, it's always a home for me. Yeah. Well, again, Michael McGlone, actor, writer, producer, director, musician, performer. It has been my honor, my pleasure, uh, and just a great show having you here with me. And uh, I want to thank you again. Thank you again. You're so welcome. All right. So everyone else. Please um, have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see everyone next week. Ciao, everybody.